Amen. Well, it is good to see you here this morning. This might be the largest 11 o'clock crowd that we've had so far since COVID began. So great to see you. Uh, if you've been keeping up with us online or if you've been here, if you're here for the first time, we're continuing in our sermon series from the book of Acts. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. If you did not bring a Bible with you, you are welcome to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1089. Now, if you don't have a Bible that you read and call your own, I want you to take that Bible home with you and use it, read it, apply it to your life, because we believe if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will. There it is. Change your life. We firmly believe that. At least Tony does. Hey, I want to be very clear about my goal. I don't always come out at the start of the sermon and say, this is what I hope happens today. What I hope happens today is that if you have not yet given your life to Jesus, or as the Bible says, if you've not yet been saved, if you've not yet been born again, my hope is today you would receive Jesus as your Savior and be, be, be saved. My second hope and goal for you is this. If you've already become a follower of Jesus, if you've already received Christ as your Savior, but you've not yet been baptized, then my hope and my goal for you is that you, at the close of this service, will get up, walk over here, and get baptized today. We've seen so far this weekend 24 spontaneous baptisms in our services. And I believe that this passage of scripture that we're going to read is going to speak to us about a little bit of spontaneity for followers of Jesus uh, that we all should have. Now, I'm not going to try to manipulate you. I'm not going to try to guilt you into being baptized. I'm not going to try to guilt you into giving your life to Jesus, but I am going to push and encourage you to respond spontaneously to the good news of Jesus, to surrender your life to Jesus, and to be baptized today. Pastor Chad, uh, the holiest man on our church campus, is going to be right there. Uh, he'd love to meet with you. So at any point during the service, if you, I guess now, Chad, you have to stay there. At any point during the service, you know, you know what? Today's the day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be baptized. I've been putting it off. Today's the day. If at any point you walk right on over there, you meet Pastor Chad, and he would love to baptize you today. You know, as followers of Jesus, uh, as followers of Jesus, we value self-control. We value denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following him. That's important for followers of Jesus if we want to become more like him. But I also believe that there, we're missing something in the life of a follower of Jesus. And I think that as followers of Christ, there's got to be a healthy dose of spontaneity in our lives. If you'll look inside your life notes and your bulletin that you were handed, you will see a little section marked spontaneous baptism. I want, you, I want to encourage you to read through that section even while I preach this morning. And I believe that God will speak to you. I want us to read together Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. We're going to read an incredible example of spontaneity. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then 
Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because someone told him about Jesus and because he took that next step and he followed through with believers baptism. As we see in this example of Philip and the Ethiopian, following Jesus sometimes requires spontaneity. It sometimes requires spontaneous living. Look at verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go, and he rose and went. You'd say, well, an angel of the Lord has never spoken to me. Okay, me either. But then look at verse 29. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him. We love self-control, we love having plans, we love clear expectations. But the fact of the matter is, if you are a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is living within you. Even in our worship services, we go into every weekend worship service with a plan. We have our songs timed. We have the message timed, if we can get the preacher to shut up. We, we have the prayer time. We have the announcements timed. We have all the copyright issues timed down. We know when the lead singer is going to sing. We know when the drummer is going to drum. We know everything that's going to happen on the stage. Why? Because we want to have a service that stops within 60 minutes so that as you invite people to church, you can rest them assured that it's not going to go on for four or five hours. Most unsaved people, most people without Jesus, they'll come to church for an hour if they know what to expect. And that's what we all like. We all like to have plans and clear expectations because plans are good and self-control is good. But as we see in this example of Philip, following Jesus sometimes requires spontaneity. Now think about it. If you're a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. We are to listen to the internal prompting of the Holy Spirit. And since you and I do not know the mind of God or the plan of God for our lives, shouldn't our lives be lived more spontaneously? Shouldn't we make decisions more spontaneously as we listen to the Holy Spirit lead us? Shouldn't we go and serve Shouldn't we go and care? Shouldn't we love on other people? Shouldn't we open up our mouth and communicate the good news of Jesus when we sense that internal prompting? In fact, followers of Jesus ought to be the most spontaneous people on the planet, not spontaneously combusting people on the planet. We ought to be the most spontaneous because the Holy Spirit is within us and there are people all around us who need to be encouraged. There are people around us that need to hear hope and good news especially in today's world. This past weekend, I had lunch plans with a friend of mine named Dale, and I asked him if I could share the story, and he said yes. Dale's in our, our life group, and we made plans to meet this Saturday, uh, this past Saturday at 11.45, not yesterday, but the week before. That morning, he sent a te text back to me, and he said he couldn't meet, but uh, maybe we can do it again. Now, we've been trying to meet for several times, and uh, he said the internet company had not yet shown up in the 12-hour window that they said they were going to show up. And he had to stick around at his house and wait and that he couldn't have lunch with me. Raise your hand if you've ever had to wait for the internet company show up, right? Like vampires sucking the life out of our life. Sorry. Sorry, if you work for Suddenly, we love you. And God loves you and he forgives you. But we all like to have schedule. We all like to have plans. We like to know what's going on. And so when Dale said that he couldn't meet with me, my first thought was, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna stay at home with my kids. I'm gonna have lunch with them. I'm gonna love on them. I sat down at the kitchen table. I told my wife that I wasn't able to meet with Dale. Dale couldn't make it. Then spontaneously, the Holy Spirit internally prompted me with this thought, you big dummy. You don't have to have lunch with him. 
Just go over to his house and tell him about Jesus. So I sent a text to Dale. I said, hey, man, is it okay if I just come over and, and talk with you? He replied back, yes. And so I got up. I was, as I was leaving my house, the girl said, Daddy, where are you going? And I said this to them. I'm going to meet with Dale, and I'm going to lead him to Jesus today. I arrived at Dale's place. I sat down at the table, and I said to him, I love you, but right now I don't want to talk about anything else. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Savior? And Dale replied back to me, I do not know how to do that. So over the next hour, we read through Scripture, we talked, and Dale gave his life to Jesus and accepted Christ as his Savior and Lord. It was so incredible. Dale knelt down. He confessed to God that he was a sinner. He surrendered his life over to him, and he invited Jesus to be his Savior. Then I'm like on this high. I'm like, oh, God, thank you. Thank you that I listened to you. And so incredible. And about an hour before the 5 o'clock service last Saturday, Dale spontaneously sent a text to me and said, I want to be baptized tonight. And he was. All of this happened because the Holy Spirit prompted me to have a conversation with Dale, to drop my plans, to do something different. And this happened because Dale also was listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit to surrender his life to Jesus. But too often, way too often, I sense the prompting of the Lord leading me to have a conversation with somebody and I don't do it. And I wonder about you, if you're a follower of Jesus, have you experienced that internal prompting of the Holy Spirit leading you to go and do or say something? In fact, why don't we do this? Why don't we raise your hand time with Pastor Joe, okay? Raise your hand if you've sensed that inner prompting of the Holy Spirit leading you to do something before awesome. And raise your hand if you did it. Raise your hand if at times you've ignored that prompting. And raise your hand if your spouse ignores your prompting all the time. <laughs> See, following Jesus sometimes requires spontaneity. It means we get out of our comfort zone. It means we do and say things that we're not necessarily we're, we're planning on doing. Following Jesus requires us to live on the edge of our faith and confidently step into the, into the space of the unknown where the Spirit is prompting us to go because there is always a next step for followers of Jesus. Do you remember the game Follow the Leader? You remember that? You know, it's not as cool as Minesweeper. You remember Minesweeper? <laughs> Clicking on the little mines. Follow the leader. That game has only two positions that you get to be. You either get to be the follower or you get to be the leader. If you don't want to be one of those positions, then you don't play the game. The person directly behind the leader doesn't know what's coming up next. Is The follower has to react spontaneously to the leader. If the leader steps with his left, that follower has to step with his left. If the leader jumps on top of the monkey bars and runs down the top of them, the follower has to do that or they are out of the game. When it comes to following Jesus, we never get to be the leader. You hear what I'm saying? If we're really a follower of Jesus, we don't get to be the leader. We're not the leader of our spiritual lives. He is. All we do as followers is follow. Now, it's clear to me that Philip's First step of obedience when the angel of the Lord said to him led to a, a more communication from the Holy Spirit. If he would have been disobedient at the first step, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't have been speaking to him the second step. And as Philip is walking along the road, as the Lord instructed him to do, the Holy Spirit spoke to him again and again, and Philip responded in obedience again. The continued next steps of obedience by Philip led to that life-changing conversation with the Ethiopian who once he gave his life to Jesus went back to another country carrying the good news of Jesus Christ. Now if you're already a follower of Jesus and you have not been yet been baptized your next step is to let your world know you are a follower of Jesus by being baptized. That is your next step. I guarantee you that. 
That's what Jesus teaches throughout Scripture. It's what the apostles teach throughout Scripture. It's what we see in this example here, that followers of Jesus, once they receive forgiveness for their sins, once they are born again and made new, their very first next step is to be baptized. That's God's plan for your life. I can tell you that with complete 100% authority from God. If you're a follower of Jesus and receive Christ as Savior, God's next step for you is to be baptized and let the whole world know, or at least your whole world know, that you're a follower of Jesus. So I want to encourage you. If you sense the prompting of the Holy Spirit right now or at any other time during this message to be baptized, I encourage you to get up. We've already seen it happen in 24 people's lives this weekend to get up during the message, walk over here and begin talking and praying with the people who are there. We have men and women who will help you take that next step of baptism. We have t-shirts for you to put on. We have towels for you to wear. In fact, if you wanna be baptized in the clothes you have on now, you certainly can do that and go home with soggy britches. And it will be awesome because you'll go to the restaurant. People are like, why are you wet? Because I'm a follower of Jesus. Why ain't you wet? <laughs> but first, it is crucial for all of us to understand receiving Jesus comes before baptism. And let me emphasize it again. Receiving Jesus comes before baptism. Now, I was baptized in the Catholic church. I was, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy. I, I was baptized before I had any idea that I could be born again. I was baptized before I had any idea that I could actually be a new creation. And once I became that new creation when I was 18 years old and I gave my life to Jesus, then a couple months later, I was baptized. Receiving Jesus comes before baptism. Now, I love the fact that the passage of Scripture that the Ethiopian was reading was written 400 years before the cross. It was Isaiah 53, and it was all about what the Messiah was going to do. And the Ethiopian had no idea. Look what that, the Ethiopian had been doing. He had gotten up, he had ridden into Jerusalem, and he worshiped in the temple, and he didn't even know God. And he's on his way back, and he's reading Isaiah 53, and the passage is all about Jesus. See, some of you came today, you're like that Ethiopian. You came today to worship, but you're not really sure who or what Jesus has done for you. I want you to know this morning, Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to give you life. Jesus came to give you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And Jesus came so that you can be born again, receive forgiveness of your sins and live a brand new life. So here's some things that happened in Isaiah 53. As the Ethiopian was reading he didn't know what he was reading, but these are some of the things that it says about the Messiah. It was our weakness that the Messiah carried. It was our sorrows that weighed Jesus down, that Jesus was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. Jesus was whipped so we could be healed. When Jesus was beaten, whipped, and punished on the cross, it was to take your place on the cross because a price had to be paid for sin and God is a just God, but he's also a merciful God. And God said, a price must be paid for the rebellion of my people and Jesus, the son of God, is going to pay it. Why? Because God wants a relationship with you, but a price had to be paid and you and I were unable to pay that price of rebellion. So Jesus did, and the weight of the world's sin was placed on him on the cross. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know that feeling of emptiness that you feel at times when sin overtakes you? The feeling of loneliness and isolation that you feel, all of that was dumped on Jesus. And Jesus said, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because 
at the cross, Jesus became sin for us, for you and for me. And then he died. He was buried in the tomb. But the story didn't end there. Three days later, the Messiah rose from the dead. Three days later, proving that he could take the punishment for sin head on and rise from the dead, proving that he held the keys to life and death in his hands and that we could be forgiven for our sins. That is what the cross was all about. That is what salvation in Christ was all about. And now I want to invite you to spontaneously become a follower of Jesus today. If you're watching with us online, I want to invite you to reach out to our online chat hosts and let them know, hey, you know what? I get it. I understand what Jesus did for me and I want a relationship with him. I want to be born again. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. See, the Ethiopian believed that the Messiah had paid the penalty for sins. He just didn't understand who the Messiah was. Philip explained to him. He opened up his mouth and he said, that's Jesus. Dale understood what Jesus has done for him, but he didn't understand how to receive Jesus as his savior. I grew up Catholic for 18 years, knowing, believing what Jesus had done for me, but had never received Christ as my personal Lord and savior. Today, if you believe, but you've not yet received God has sent me here to tell you today how to receive Jesus. I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to do something that we seldom do here at Calvary. Across the room, I want to invite you to bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to talk to God. And if you believe that what Jesus has done for you, I want you to say something like this. You can say it out loud. You can whisper it in your heart. God, today I admit to you that I'm a sinner and I deserve death. But I believe Jesus paid my death for me. That Jesus died for me on the cross. And in your own words and in your own way, tell God that you believe he has forgiven your sins because Jesus paid your penalty. And then in your own words and in your own way, say to Jesus, I turn my life over to you and I ask you to be my Savior and Lord in Jesus' name. I want you to look at me for just a second. If you just said that and you meant it, you prayed that prayer of salvation, the Bible says you're a new creation The Bible says your sins are forgiven. The Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is now living in you. That's what makes you a new creation. I want to encourage you to do something. If you came with a loved one, if you came with a guest, uh, or if you're a guest and came with a friend, I just want to invite you, if you just prayed that prayer and you gave your life to Jesus, would you turn and whisper to them, hey, I just surrendered my life to Jesus. Do that right now. And if you came and if you're by yourself, I want you to text somebody. And I want you to text a loved one, text a friend and say, hey, today I just gave my life to Jesus at church. So the Ethiopian, he's hearing about Jesus. Philip leads him to the Lord. And then Philip told him, hey, your next step is to be baptized. And so as they're riding along of all places in the desert, they come across some water. And the Ethiopian says, hey, there's some water. That's a big deal when you're in the desert. Why can't I get baptized here? What is to stop me from being baptized? Then then the Ethiopian stopped the chariot, got down, they walked in the water, and Philip baptized him. That is what uh, Dale did Saturday. That is what I did a couple months after I gave my life to Jesus. And that is what you can do today. If you've never been baptized since you gave your life to Jesus, you can do it spontaneously today. You have lunch plans, they can wait. You got friends that are here with you, they will wait for you and they will celebrate with you. We want to invite you today to spontaneously respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit 
We've got some shirts for you to change into. We've got separate changing room for the boys and the girls. Also, I want to add three more points very quickly. You can be baptized today if you trusted Jesus as your Savior this morning and you want to be baptized. I can guarantee you that's God's plan for your life. Secondly, maybe you became a believer after you were baptized. Maybe you were baptized like I was as a kid, but you weren't a follower of Jesus yet. You later came to faith in Christ as an adult. Or maybe you never have been baptized since trusting Christ as your Savior. And let me just say something about pride for a moment. Some people have been attending Calvary for a long time and everybody thinks... Oh, you've been saved a long time. You've been following Jesus for a long time. You've been baptized for a long time. And because of pride, you won't come forward to be baptized. Can I say to you, why not now? Why not be baptized now? Why not respond spontaneously to the good news of Jesus and be baptized right now and in this moment? So let me explain how this is going to wrap up. Our band is going to come out in just a second. They're going to lead us in a closing song. And during that closing song, I'm going to stay on the platform. and I'm going to keep on hoping and, and talking to you about following the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And as they lead us in that song, I want to encourage you to get up and move over here. There's Larry. Larry, raise your hand. Larry, I'd love to see you. I don't know where Chad went, but Chad's back there somewhere. We would love to see you respond by faith living on the edge of your faith, walking into the unknown, responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit today. That's our hope for you. That's our prayer for you. So let me pray. Father, it's my prayer and my praise. I know somebody here gave their life to you this morning. Someone surrendered their life to you this morning and we celebrate that. In fact, many did. Lord, we also ask that you would prompt individuals. They would sense that pulling, that sense that the Holy Spirit, this is what you want them to do. You don't want them to wait any longer. You don't want them to put it off any longer. You don't want them to wait for a lake baptism any longer or wait for parents or friends or family to be there. Spirit, you're calling them today to walk in obedience. And I pray that you would give them that bold confidence to take those steps of faith, to live on the edge of faith and walk into the unknown today. Lord, we invite you to change and transform us in Jesus' name.